Welcome back to my high school economics class. This is Dr. Kling. Today's topic I call income equals spending. It's part of macroeconomics. Macroeconomics <coughs> looks tends to look at the economy as a set of equations and there one of the types of equations are called identities. Or sometimes they're called accounting identities. And so what they are are equations that are true by construction. That's sort of why, how the data are constructed determines these accounting identities. So what I would say income equals spending, what they're trying to convey is that one person's income is another person's spending. And in AP economics, they often will draw this circular flow diagram. And I may not be drawing it right, but here's one way to draw it. We can have businesses over here and households over here. And then we can have some circles. That's where this circular flow will be. So what will the, the households will supply factors of production, including labor, land, and capital, to businesses. And businesses will supply goods to households. That's, a, that's sort of the spending pattern or whatever. And then the, uh, in terms of dollar flows, businesses pay households for their factors of production. And households, in turn, pay businesses for goods and services. So the dollars flow this way in this flow around the circle. The goods and the factors of production flow around the circle. Uh, I'm not sure if I have that right, but if you uh, if you have that uh, circular flow diagram correct, it's sometimes worth a uh, multiple choice question on the AP. Um, what this looks like <coughs> in terms of the equations is that we have so income we typically put on the left side is equal to y is equal to total spending. And then we divide up income and spending into different categories. So the spending categories are consumer spending, investment, government spending, and net exports. So let's just write these down. C is consumer spending. I is investment. So that's purchases of, of capital goods. So buildings, Things like buildings, like factories or apartment buildings or even houses, and <coughs> um, machinery that you use in factories. Okay, so that's our investment. And then we have... G is government purchases, purchases of goods and services. It's not, uh, it doesn't include transfer payments. Where the government just hands people checks, like social security checks. That, that doesn't count as a government purchase of goods or service, <coughs> services. And then uh, let X be 
exports of goods and services, I the imports of goods and services, and if we're talking about our production or spending on domestic product, we want ex when we export something that is spending on what we produce, but when we import that is us spending on other people's stuff, and so we want to net that out, and so x minus m is net exports, which is really what we want to count as GDP. So y, so we'll, I'll just write this again, GDP is equal to y, we write it as y is equal to c plus i plus g plus net exports. Now on the left hand side, because of this circular flow, all spending shows up as income, and the income can be used basically for consumption and saving and tax payments. That's how income is absorbed. So income actually it could be income that uh, <coughs> is held at corporations or held by households. And uh, but some of it, and then some of it will be taxed, and that'll go to government. So we have consumption plus saving plus taxes. So let me just write out the saving and the taxes part. So S is saving, and it really includes corporate saving, although we don't often talk about it in freshman economics, but it includes. Uh, corporate saving, also known as retained earnings. So businesses can be saving as well as households can be saving. But we often ignore that. And then uh, T is tax payments. Okay, so we put this all together in one big equation. And we can write C plus S plus T, that's all the ways you can use your income, equals income, equals spending, so we'll do equals GDP, equals C plus I plus G plus X minus M. And if you, uh, if you like algebra, it's very tempting to get rid of the C's on both sides and write this as S plus T is equal to I plus G plus X minus M. And if you're in uh, economics, you're tempted to rearrange this to, to put the this over, move this over, and move this over, and that will give us, and group them in it this way. Take, take the investment and uh, subtract saving minus investment. Subtract the government spending from the taxes, and that will equal net exports. So with this, and <coughs> we put labels on these things in the parentheses, this is private saving, private domestic saving, plus government saving. I'm going to put ha 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 in parentheses because the government tends to run a big deficit. That is, it's, it's usually way, way less than zero. So the government is dissaving. They're running a deficit. Private saving plus government saving equals net exports or equals um, sort of uh, foreign dissaving. So if the foreigners are, are not saving, then we are. Or if we're not saving, then foreigner, foreign saving has to make up for it. So when 
the left hand side is less than zero which has been in for the United States for uh, many years now so when this is less than zero that means our domestic saving is less than zero that means that uh, foreign saving has to make up for it so we have that means we have negative net exports which means we have a trade deficit which means that we use foreign saving to finance finances foreign saving finances some of our domestic spending so that's a uh, now remember those identities have to hold so you will never see um, negative domestic saving and positive net exports that just the the accounts won't, won't even allow for that so if, if we want to have positive net exports another way of thinking of that is we have to have positive domestic saving so our private saving has to be big enough to make up for the government deficit or maybe one day the government will run a surplus in that case with a government surplus and some private saving then we can actually have some positive net exports um, one thing about um, this trade deficit I'm going to argue, and, and, and this is actually not a general point of view, it's my point of view, that we don't owe the trade deficit. If your neighbors and friends buy lots of foreign goods, uh, it, <clears throat> you know, they have to figure out a way to earn foreign currency to pay for those goods but you personally don't have to worry about that similarly if um, if your friends and neighbors borrow a lot of money from abroad which is really what what happens when you when the when foreign saving finances domestic spending that means that somebody domestically is borrowing from abroad well, if it's your friends and neighbors who are borrowing from abroad, you don't have to worry about paying that back. Your friends and neighbors have to worry about it. Now, of course, if it's the government that's uh, doing the borrowing, borrowing from abroad, which uh, so it's negative government saving, so negative government saving, and if that's uh, and if that's what's what foreigners are lending money for then maybe you do you do have to worry about paying them back but the thing that you have to worry about paying back is the negative government saving you do not have to worry about paying back any negative private saving any private borrowing so i think i'll finish that tour of the national income accounts there and next time start with a simple keynesian model